Welcome to www.ilovehistory.co.uk Think. Question. Understand. Hello, this video is looking at England under Queen Elizabeth I between 1558 and 1603. And in particular, it's thinking about our first key question. What problems faced Elizabeth in 1558? To understand the problems that Elizabeth faced, it's necessary to look at the period that preceded her. The historian Whitney Jones has written about a mid-Tudor crisis, starting from the last years of Henry VIII's reign and characterised by weak rulers. For example, Edward VI was a boy when he started, Mary, well, she was a woman. Inflation, this was a period of rising prices, triggered by the debasement of the coinage under Henry VIII and Edward was a period of rebellions, for example Wyatt's Rebellion in 1554, of factional fighting in court, for example the young boy king's court was riven with divisions between Somerset and Northumberland. But perhaps the most fundamental division of the mid-Tudor crisis was that thrown up by the Reformation and then Mary's counter-Reformation. Armigel Ward, the clerk to the Privy Council in 1558, wrote that the monarchy is not well regarded, and the realm is exhausted. Although we must be careful when thinking about a mid-Tudor crisis. For example, more recent historians such as David Lodes and John Matusiak have questioned the extent to which it existed. We're going to look then at the problems that faced Elizabeth in 1558. As we do, it will be important for you to think about how serious the problems were, and also how effectively Elizabeth dealt with them. First up then, finance. Mary had had some successes with dealing with finance. For example, she'd improved the exchequer to increase revenue, introduced a new book of rates to ensure that customs duties increased. But Mary had also been involved in a costly war with France, and by the end of her reign she had left a debt of £300,000. Moreover, she'd sold crown lands in order to pay for the war. The problems were made worse by the rising population, by the rapid inflation. And in the 1550s, the cloth trade with Antwerp, one of the main markets for English cloth, collapsed. Unemployment was rising, and this was all exacerbated by bad harvests and flu epidemics, which killed up to 200,000. However, on coming to power, Elizabeth cut back on expenditure. By 1585, she'd paid off Mary's debts, and indeed had built up a reserve of £300,000. The next problem to consider is religion. Elizabeth's religion meant that she was not regarded as the legitimate heir by many Roman Catholics. Henry II of France, for example, supported Mary, Queen of Scots. Regardless of whether Catholics supported her, Elizabeth was Queen, and she needed to decide on the nature of the religious settlement that she would impose. In February 1559, bills were presented to Parliament. The historian Neil has suggested that there was considerable pressure from the Commons for a more Protestant settlement than Elizabeth wanted, with Marian exiles returning to form a Puritan choir. More recently, historians such as Christopher Haig have questioned whether this choir existed. There certainly was opposition from the Catholic bishops in the Lords. Two of them were arrested and from those who were worried about a woman being supreme head of the church. Nevertheless, by April 1559, the Acts of Supremacy and Uniformity had passed. Elizabeth took the title of Supreme Governor of the Church of England, partly to tackle unease over her gender, and promising not to make windows into men's hearts, she imposed her settlement. A third area to consider is that of foreign affairs. When Elizabeth became queen, England was still technically at war with France. The loss of Calais by Mary had been a major blow to English prestige and the traditional claims of English kings over France. Sir John Mason claimed that our state can no longer bear these wars. The cost was certainly huge. Moreover, French soldiers were in Scotland which itself was ruled by Mary of Guise on behalf of her daughter Mary, Queen of Scots. The old alliance between France and Scotland was strong. Armagel Ward stated, The French king bestrides the realm 
having one foot in Calais and the other in Scotland. Mary's policies seemed to have failed. To make matters worse for Elizabeth, her religion made the traditional alliance between England and the Habsburg family harder to maintain. In 1559, the Treaty of Cato Cambraces ended the war between France and Spain and, as a result, between France and England. This peace would have longer-term implications for Elizabeth as she was unable then to play the two powers off of each other. Peace with France did allow England to turn its attentions to its northern borders. William Cecil pushed hard, despite Elizabeth's reluctance, for intervention in Scotland in 1560. In 1559, £5,000 had been sent to aid the rebels in Scotland, and in 1560, 8,000 English troops followed. The Treaty of Edinburgh, signed in July 1560, secured the Scottish Reformation. French troops were withdrawn. Mary, Queen of Scots, recognised Elizabeth as the Queen of England. It truly was a triumph. Finally, then, we need to consider Elizabeth's personality, her gender. We need to consider Elizabeth herself. For the failure of Mary's reign had been widely attributed to her gender. On seeing Elizabeth for the first time, one London woman is said to have exclaimed, O oh Lord, the Queen is a woman. Later in her reign, the Lord Deputy of Ireland complained of having to serve Elizabeth, saying, God's wounds, this it is to serve a base, bastard, pissing kitchen woman. Elizabeth was expected as a woman to marry, and to marry soon. Philip II of Spain, in his marriage proposal to her in 1559, wrote that she should marry that her husband might relieve her of those labours which are only fit for men. But it wasn't just her ex-brother-in-law pestering her for marriage. Parliament asked Elizabeth to consider marriage in 1559, 1566 and again in 1576. Moreover, the process of securing a husband could involve the Queen in dangerous scandal. In 1560, as gossip spread about a potential marriage between Elizabeth and her childhood sweetheart, Robert Dudley, scandalous rumours also grew of a plot to kill Dudley's wife. However, Elizabeth managed to turn gender, which should have been a weakness, into a strength. She was capable of playing the weak woman, as when, in 1563, she lamented to Parliament that she was simply a woman, wanting but wit and memory. Elizabeth was capable, too, of playing the strong woman, for example, when in 1566 she turned to Robert Dudley and stated, I will have but one mistress and no master. By 1603, Elizabeth felt confident enough in her image as the Virgin Queen married to her country to state, My sex cannot diminish my prestige. But the origins of this image can be seen right at the start of her reign. As her coronation day procession wound its way through the streets of London, banners compared Elizabeth to Deborah, the judge and restorer of religion from the Old Testament. John Knox, who had complained about the monstrous rule of women before, saw a special role for Elizabeth as one raised up by God to protect the Protestant church. Of course, Elizabeth never did marry. In 1563, she told a visiting ambassador that she would rather end up a beggar woman and single far rather than queen and married. But ultimately, it didn't matter. Elizabeth had survived her initial problems and was on course to become Gloriana. <laughs>